you're listening to it came from the radio i'm here with bob rich now bob rich has retired five times as a research scientist builder's laborer a nurse a director of professional association a psychotherapist he's published 19 books won six awards he answers posts at queendom.com he's in a group for suicide prevention at Cora. He does so many things, even more. So welcome to the show, Bob Rich. Thank you. Now, first question. It seems like you've devoted a great deal of your time to helping people who are alive now. And in your on your page, you mentioned wanting to also help the future generations, like your grandchildren, or maybe just your grandchildren. Now, what drives you to help other people? I could give several answers to that. One is, all sentient beings are apprentice Buddhas or apprentice Jesuses. And the way an apprentice learns is by copying the master. You act as if you were already enlightened, insofar as you can. And to quote my friend the Dalai Lama, my religion is kindness. The aim of enlightenment is to be of service. Aim of enlightenment is to be in service. And I another answer, if I may, mm -hmm. in my book, Ascending Spiral, which is actually my fictionalized autobiography, I, I report an email conversation with a young woman whom I've renamed Maria. Uh, and I say to her, only two things matter in life. What you take with you when you die and what you leave in the hearts of the others. Everything else is monopoly money. Hmm. So actually on that note, what would you like other people to take on and save in their lifetimes about you when you about are no longer me. here. That's that's interesting. The, there is an acceptance and commitment therapy uh, technique called writing your own obituary. So you've died and one of your grandchildren stands up and and talks about you and you're asked to write that for that person. Hmm. I like so that. that. That's the question you asked, because that sets up how you want to run the rest of your life. Right. Right. I actually think about, I actually think about uh, what the planet might look like after, you know, 100, 200 years. And I often think about what life will be like in my 90s and what I would like to leave behind. I would say almost every day. And that drives my daily decisions. Is that normal? You are, you, is that a normal thing to most people? Well, like that? No, normal means average. It's the walking wounded. You don't want to be normal. Right. You want to be way above normal. And that's what my book, From Depression to Contentment, is about. Uh, at the moment, I'm in the final stages of designing a 10-session online course on positive psychology, which is how to build your inner strength despite the craziness of the world we're in. Unfortunately, yeah. this course will only be available to people within Australia. Oh, okay. But uh, oh, wow. it, all the contents are in my book on the, uh, you know, from depression to contentment, uh, and uh, you don't even have to read it; it's available as an, as an audio. But uh, you know what? I'll jump right to one of my questions about your book right here. So I got I got a little quote. So in your book, "Depression to Contentment," you write. As I'll show you, deliberately making the choice of treating all other humans as our brothers and sisters is one of the major defenses against depression. Now, I know when I do this and I treat people like my family, 
I do feel palpably more connected, less alone, more fulfilled, uh, more peaceful, less worried. Why do you think this phenomenon occurs? Well, again, there are many answers. Sure. One is, one of the early chapters in the book is called First Aid. Uh, but nowadays I call it the seven magic bullets because that's more fun. All right. And okay. One of them, one of the seven is meaning, which is uh, started with Victor Frankl, his research well, while he was a, a, a slave of in the Nazi concentration camps. He stayed alive and and not contented, but, you know, functioning, because his aim was to survive and report his research on what made some people survive and some people not. But the other six of the seven are research on what makes uh, hunter-gatherers, pre-industrial people, society work. Hmm. And for them... They cannot even imagine themselves in isolation. In our crazy Western society, it's all about me, 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 the ego. We think we can exist by ourselves, which is an illusion. Mm. One has written, no man is an island, and that's correct. In, before the white invasion, for Australian Aborigines, if one committed a terrible crime, he or she would be banished from the tribe and would inevitably die. Mm. It's like this. This is a part of me. It's a functioning part. If I cut it off, I will still be going. I'll, it'll hurt. I'll be handicapped, but I'll still be going. But the thumb will be dead. Mm. And that's how, how they feel. And we evolved over millions of years from the perhaps the first mammal or, or earlier. We have evolved to being social beings. Hmm. All right. So, you know, I'm going to skip into uh, a first aid for depression or the magic bullets. Uh, one more question on that uh, before we move on a little bit. What, what are some ways to treat depression what are a few first aids you could just give us maybe one or two not you don't have to give the whole book i mean you can't you have so mm -hmm. much under your belt there's no way to cover anything even in four hours five or six hours but maybe a few tips for the audience well the seven magic bullets give you resilience they enable you to cope with anything anxiety depression hopelessness uh physical illness, anything, you'll handle whatever the world throws at you, you'll handle better if you have a good dose of the seven magic bullets in your life. Mm -hmm. One is restful sleep, neither too much nor too little. And I had a one example, a young man who was grieving uh, one of his friends was drunk and uh, out of his mind on marijuana and he killed one of their group. Ooh. This boy, my client, had held the dying boy and later on in court he was forced to testify against his friend. So he was in terrible grief. And in the morning he just couldn't, he, he was sleeping 17 hours a day because while he was asleep, he was okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we arranged, he was an apprentice mechanic. We arranged, in the morning, he'd set his alarm for seven or uh, seven o'clock, and he would get up, brush his teeth, have a shower, have a shave, do all the morning things. And then if he chose to, he could go back to bed. But he never did. Once he was up, he went to work. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's a very good tip. Sometimes you just have to act as if and just 
make sure that your body is moving in ways that maybe your mind might not want to at the moment. A lot of times your mind will follow what your body does and vice versa. And too, too little sleep is, is, is even worse. Mm-hmm. And there I, I use a meditative technique. A meditative uh, technique, okay. It's basically mindfulness meditation, which is a wonderful skill to have anyway. And what keeps you awake when you can't sleep is the worry thought, oh, I feel terrible in the morning. I've got to get to sleep now. And of course, the more you push it, the less you less you can sleep. Mm-hmm. So breathe in, focus, air going in your nose, filling your chest, tummy rising. And as you breathe out, you feel the tummy go down, air going out of your chest, coming out your nose. So there's three things to focus on, and you can add a fourth. When your body is completely relaxed, and your mind is at peace, it is just as restful as if you were asleep. So I add the mantra, just as while breathing in, restful while breathing out. So that's four things to concentrate on. Simply doesn't leave any space for the worry thoughts. Mm. You You drift off. And even if you didn't, it's just as restful. (laughs) <laughs> I found a way to up the ante on that meditation. I have my dog right here. I don't think you can see her, but she's so peaceful. And every time I even just look at her, I'm looking at her in the mirror. When I look at her, my breathing becomes more regular, more deeper. A lot of times it's shallow. I instantly feel calmer. So sometimes maybe you think of a dog or sometimes a person, but usually an animal uh, that you really love or feel connected to can also help to regulate that breathing and maybe even help with the meditation. So I'll call it a dog of meditation. <laughs> well, you've just gone back to connectedness. You know, it's not just all humans who are my family. All sentient beings are my family, hmm. including trees and even that annoying little sister, the mosquito. I have mosquitoes all around me. That's why I'm moving around like this. Have you noticed? (laughs) They're not ticks. It's mosquitoes. I have a mosquito (laughs) in my house. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's what I don't want to do. I used to kill annoying insects. I can't do that anymore. I'll trap them. Or I'll put down an insect repellent, you know? Yeah, oh, that's what I'll do. That's what I'll do. But this mosquito, I don't know, man. I, I might have to kill it during this interview if yeah. if it's if I see it. Occasionally, I may be forced to kill an animal. Like there are young children near where I live, and there was a redback spider raising her young, uh-huh. and I was concerned about those children. And one of my rules is, above all, do no harm. If you can do good. If you can't do good, change the situation until you can. But the full quote is, above all, do no harm, except to avoid a greater harm. So I was forced to kill this mother spider and the babies to, to, because, because if she bit or one of her children bit those children, that would be a greater harm. And so yeah. what I could do was to apologize. You know, I think the American doctors need to follow that phrase. I don't think they're following that lately. Do no mm-hmm. harm. But anywho, it's, you know, that's another topic for another day. It'll get me banned on YouTube and banned from Facebook, and you can't talk about yeah, anything anyway. that goes against the Western doctors right now. I know I am one. Anyway, do you want to go on to with the magic bullets or, or a different topic? What? Well, Right. I, my next question is, uh, well, to me, I had, uh, believe it or not, I had past, past lives and will hopefully have no more is a comforting thought. So in your book, you tell us why, in your words, why reincarnation is a wonderful tool for p- achieving contentment. How does the existence of reincarnation help humans to be more content and at ease? Well, for a start, if you want this to be your last life, then you you have to become enlightened. 
you have to become like Jesus or like yeah. Gandhi. You know the story of why Gandhi was killed? It no. was the same reason Jesus was killed. He, in 1948, he stood up in front of thousands of Hindus. If this was the middle of the uh, of the war between Muslims and Hindus in India. And he said, what should you do if Muslims killed your beloved little son? And came crowds from the, uh, the crowd shouted, vengeance, vengeance. Hmm. He said, no, go out and find a little Muslim boy of the same age, both of whose parents have been killed by Hindus. Take him into your life, take him into your heart, and raise him as, as a good Muslim. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate lesson. Mm. Jesus was killed for the same reason. Mm. Right? Unconditional love. And that's why he was. That's why he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. So you're saying basically, if you don't want to kill yourself, you can uh, just have unconditional love, and then people will do it for you. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's a crazy. That's a crazy joke. No, but... that, 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 no, no, that doesn't matter. I've done it all too often. Interesting. Right. Uh, so back. Uh... But, but, but look. So. You also wrote that there was a an ex colleague of yours who's very hostile to you now. Oh so, right, well, not now, but I was warned. Yes, that's so. The first step is to completely and utterly say, "I forgive you," deep in your heart. Offer forgiveness. I have a little Buddhist prayer I say to myself about three times a week, uh, dying to specific instances. Uh, if at any time I have in any way harmed any other person, knowingly or unknowingly, accidentally or on purpose, I ask for forgiveness. If any other person has harmed me in any way, knowingly or un un unknowingly, accidentally or on purpose, I offer forgiveness. If you can do this deeply and completely, that's a big step toward not having to come back. Hmm. But the thing is, you don't have to live perfect, you only have to die perfect. Nelson Mandela started as a revolutionary. He spent 22 years in jail, and he came out as an enlightened person. And he was single-handedly responsible for stopping the bloodshed in South Africa. Wonderful man. But he had to get there g going through a violent phase. You only have to die perfect. So I'm working hard at it, but I, I think I will have to come back because there are some things that I want to make restitution for. Huh. I've done things in my life that, you know, are dragging down on my karma. Really? Mm. And you don't think you can fix it in this lifetime? Maybe. I don't know. I think there's a lot. I'll tell you this. I can't get into all the specifics, and this isn't about me today, but... Uh, you know, uh, one time in my life, maybe two or, or three total, I've knowingly done some bad things, right? And it felt like I was getting immediate karma. I got tires on my car that had popped. But I dedicated myself to 10 months or 11 months, I think it was 10, of repentance and doing good deeds. And and I got to tell you, and one time I just did a day of good deeds, I like I got immediate good luck. So I don't know. To me, good deeds, maybe it's placebo or not. There's something yeah. to it because it, it was almost magical. Maybe it's coincidence, yeah. but it felt like a crazy movie. So I don't know. Maybe just do a bunch of good deeds and maybe you could seek restitution. But before we complete this interview, actually, we're at the very, 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 very end of the interview. I was going to ask you, 
uh, how you can demonstrate reincarnation um, as you wrote a whole bunch on reincarnation, but I guess we're going to have to get you back at another time unless you have a final thought on that one. Oh, well, for a start, for many millions of people, you don't need proof. And this is even in, in Islamic cultures, Islam is the uh, one religion that the concept of reincarnation is not compatible with because Muhammad explicitly says what happens after death. But mm -hmm. even so, even in Islamic countries, there are people who have had past life recalls. And they can't help it, they're convinced. Uh, but I'm a skeptic. I don't believe anything. I go with the evidence. And there is evidence strong enough for reincarnation that it would stand up in a court of law. Well, that is a great final thought. And on that note, I would uh, love to hear from you more, but I have to then, close this interview until Mark Torres gets upset. Could you tell our listeners where to find you on the internet, your website? Okay. The, the, the place that if you enter bobbing around mm -hmm. Dr. Bob Rich in an internet search, you'll find me. But the link is bobrich18.wordpress.com. All right. Thank you so much for being a guest on our show. And now back to the studio for more.